Looking out today through the eyes, he has the privilege of enjoying the television, radio, and news media. After listening to it for a while, he is so sick he is practically ready to go to bed. <laughs> but the eyes bring him all of this material through a secondary series of eyes, such as motion pictures and television. The mind, therefore, is constantly bombarded and the fact of sight is continually reporting conditions that gradually come into prominence through visualization. The eyes result in the visualization of virtue and of vice. There is visualization of violence, crime, there is all kinds of negative testimony, and there are also what we all hope for and look for, benevolent testimonies. But the eyes in this case create by themselves a way of life or a series of convictions which are at the moment afflicting a large part of the human race. These are the uses of visual imagery to perpetuate attitudes that are essentially wrong. Now the person, if he uses his mental coordinator, must naturally censor what he sees. Without censorship, the faculty of sight can lead to terrible disasters. So he must learn to censor his own seeing. And in order to censor his own seeing, he has to go back again to the mental coordinator. For this gives him a series of cooperative internal functions such as experience, memory, tradition, religion, philosophy, and common sense. Now, common sense in Buddhism would be the common testimony of the five senses. It means that they are all having their say. They are all proving what they can prove about themselves and each other. Also, the common sense carries within it the superstructure of the sixth sensory perception power, the coordinator. So when you see something on television, on the street corner, or wherever you see it, memory begins to associate with this. Where have you seen something similar before? Where have you read about it? Where have you studied the meaning of it? What do you, you know or believe concerning the merit or demerit of the process that you are considering. If the uh, coordinator is functioning and the mind is normal and proper, it will censor itself. The mind can prove, for example, that similar things have happened to you in the past, and when you treated them properly, they improved. When you mistreated them, they got worse. So wherever a new incident arises, the coordinator, like the computer, will bring into focus previous knowledge concerning these things or that particular thing. This process is almost instantaneous, and therefore it passes as a thought or a remembrance or something that we knew but had not noted lately. Actually, therefore, through the media of the sensory perceptions, we bring in all kinds of testimonies. Uh, through the eyes, we also bring in the printed page. We bring in the book that we plan to read or have read. And we are confronted instantly, more or less, with the estimation of the meaning of that book. Is it a good book? Is it a useful one? Or is it a trashy publication? And then comes the moral question of why do we like it? Do we like it because it is a superior achievement? Is it a literary masterpiece? Or do we like it because it plays to some negative attitudes in ourselves? Do we pick it because it is a sensational work? Or do we pick it because it is instructive and valuable to our lives? The whole field of fiction, therefore, comes also into focus. Fiction is more relevant than we may realize. Fiction is very often simply a 
verbal form of symbolism. Fiction may be an imaginary situation based upon circumstances that could be true, and the end of these circumstances is a situation that might exist. In, in Tibet, for example, there is no fictional literature. These people have never believed in fiction. They have wonderful legendary, all kinds of allegories, fables and moral, moral writings. They have wonderful fairy tales and so forth, but these things are not considered fiction. If they have a foundation in some integrities, if they picture something that is real and important, then they are worth reading. If they cater only to sensationalism in ourselves, or in some way to uh, superficial instincts, they're not worth reading. So they, the Tibetans have the simple statement, if it isn't true, don't read it. This, and you might say, if it isn't true, don't look at it. Because the more you take in things that are untrue, the more you may be influenced by them. And unless the mental coordinator steps in and proves to you conclusively that this is imagination, this is fiction, you become over-influenced with something that is not true.